Welcome, my name is John Ackerley, and we're going to talk about wood stoves. And um, I, apparently I get the whole hour. They only got one speaker for this session. So I'd love to just have a lot of you know, Q&A during the uh, presentation, because I don't have you know, too many slides. OK, a little bit about my um, organization. I work for a nonprofit educational group in Maryland. And uh, we promote wood heating, pellet heating. Spend a lot of time trying to get states to give incentives for especially pellet stoves, but also wood stoves. And like in Maryland, we went to them. They were they used to give ten thousand dollars to put solar panels on your house, and we showed them how that was going to really wealthy families. And we said, you know, if you're given that much to put solar panels, you should at least be given a thousand dollars to put in a pellet stove. Uh, you know, for ordinary families around the state. And after we got shot down twice in the legislature. But the state government really liked the idea, so the state ended up doing it. But we try to do this with states all over the country and get a little more recognition for wood stoves um, and pellet stoves. Um, so this show, just shows where wood is burned. It's kind of uh, you know obvious, but it's interesting. You know, you have like New Mexico. Whoops, you have New Mexico down here. It's one of the the, uh, and you have these two states are among the top ten. West Virginia, so it's not just a northern tier thing. Um, this is all U.S. Census info. And I think one of the reasons we're all here, well, that there are more people here, is because wood heating went through a huge rise between 2000 and 2010. It was the fastest growing heat source in the country. And a lot of these uh, states in the northeast this was like 100% growth in wood heating. Uh, you can see the, you know, there's 80 to 140%. Um, everywhere except the south, wood stove uh, use climbed rapidly. And the thing is, these weren't people buying new wood stoves necessarily. These were people bringing old wood stoves back into use. So the result was a lot more wood smoke pollution. And that's um, you know, brought a, uh, a backlash to our community because during the 80s and 90s, not so many people were burning wood. Uh, of course, they were in the 70s. Uh, but now it's, it's become uh, a much bigger issue. And we had the rise of outdoor wood boilers, especially up in these states. And the outdoor wood boiler issue, uh, that created a lot of backlash because a lot of people didn't uh, use them very well. And just uh, Harry Watt and I were just debating what counties were burned wood the most. So I put this together. And this, there, there may be counties in the country that are even more than 40%. But the US government tracks all this, but they only track primary heating. So they only know when the census asks how you heat your home, they only ask what your primary heating system is. So if you have you know, 20, 30% heating with wood, that means you have 50 or 60 people percent with wood stoves. And, Tons of people are, of course, just using it for secondary heating. But even down in Mississippi, that's a primarily uh, black county. 10% um, of the population. Garrett County, Maryland, the highest percentage in Maryland is 12%. OK, so there's a lot of what I want to talk about today is the EPA regulations and what this is doing uh, to wood burning in America. And there's a lot of fear that. The EPA regulations are going to are overly burdensome. They're going to drive prices of stoves up. Um, but please uh, ask questions if, uh, as we go through this. So basically, you know, stoves in 1988 was the first time EPA regulated stoves. And they said a stove had to hit 7.5 grams an hour. What? Grams of PM. Oh, no, PM, particulate matter. Yeah, yeah. So 7.5 grams of smoke, basically. Then um, last year, they went to four and a half grams an hour. And in 2020, they're going to go down to two or two and a half. So pretty rapid uh, fall, at least between now and 2020. But nothing you know, happened between 1990 and um, 2015. And a really interesting thing, you know, they've always tested wood stoves with crib wood, which means two by fours. Um, because that's, they figured they could at least test them fairly against each other if they put the exact same 2x4s in a stove. 
Now the EPA um, and the industry, everyone wants to move to cordwood because stoves turned out they were fine-tuned to burn really well with two by fours. Of course, no one burns two by fours, so now <laughs> the, uh, the stove manufacturers will start to tune their stoves to burn what we all burn in them. So that's one of the really good things about these regulations is that uh, we're switching the way we test stoves. Now, the uh, industry is suing the EPA, so the, the big manufacturers don't want to go down to two, two and a half grams an hour. They want to stick at four and a half grams an hour. Um, so I think, personally, the biggest threat to wood burning, you know, potentially is uh, once we, if we have like two really warm winters in a row, or can you imagine if we had three warm winters in a row, and you know, this, this may happen, I think it's likely to happen soon. That's gonna that puts a real dent in the purchase of wood stoves and, of course, in the firewood. Um, and there are some things which are helping stoves prices stay low. I mean, low gas prices actually keep the industry being able to build the stoves cheaper. Um, and a big shift happened. You know, we all. Uh, it used to be 70% of, of the country bought their wood stove from a specialty hearth dealer. And they were getting the better, you know, yodels and quadrifiers, harmons. During the recession, um, pe people started buying stoves from big box stores. So a lot of the big uh, uh, kind of name brand uh, stove companies lost market share. And now it's like Englander and U.S. Stove. Um, who are really uh, the ones selling much, many more stoves. Okay, so this is, we have people are wondering how the heck are wood stoves gonna hit two grams an hour? So what we're seeing now is a lot of manufacturers are going back to catalysts. And uh, catalysts got a real bad name in the 80s and 90s because a lot of them weren't designed well and the catalysts didn't hold up. But the catalytic stoves are much better designed now. The, cat, the, the companies are even guaranteeing the cat for eight years. So if your cat stops working or burns out, you get a free new catalyst within eight, eight years. The other big trend is these hybrid stoves. Sorry. So um, they have, you know, you know, pretty much every stove now, a secondary combustion. What happens is, is the smoke comes through here you inject oxygen at the top of the stove box. That's where your secondary burn happens. Because in the old-fashioned stoves, the smoke just goes straight up. You have primary air, which comes in the bottom, and there is often no secondary air. So you weren't able to reburn that smoke. And we all know, I mean, smoke is just little teeny pieces of wood. So if you burn that smoke, there's a lot of BTUs in smoke. So that's what, when you reburn that wood, that smoke, before it goes out, you're capturing a lot more heat. So now these hybrid stoves, what they do, they, they do the regular secondary combustion that like 90% of all stoves have, new stoves, and then it goes through a catalyst. So you get reburning here, and you get reburning here, and you're capturing BTUs in both <coughs> places. And I think these are gonna really take off. Um, there's some on the market that are about 2,000 bucks. Um, and there's some for 3,000, 4,000 too, but I think the prices will come down on these. And this is great because it offers a consumer, even if they don't know how to engage their catalyst, and that's the problem with catalytic stoves, a lot of consumers don't engage them. But if you don't engage catalyst, you're still getting the secondary burn here. What does that mean to engage? Well, the way a catalyst works is you have to let the stove get up to temperature, and then there's a lever and it'll put the catalyst in the path of the smoke. Um, and when the smoke goes through a catalyst exactly the same as in your car, you know, it, re it burns the little particles. So that's, that's the only reason our cars can pass uh, regulations, because they have a catalyst and an oxygen sensor. So in a way, some, a lot of you know, stove manufacturers, they go to Detroit and study how cars are made, and it's kind of the, where, you know, combustion is combustion, and if you can control it well enough, you'll, you can clean it up. Any other questions on that? What's actually the catalyst doing? Um, or is it, how does it heat? How does it reheat the stove? Is it run by electricity? Or 
No, no electricity. That's why the first half hour you can't engage the catalyst because the catalyst has to go up to temperature. So the whole stove has to get hot. And only when the catalyst is hot does it work. Because if you put smoke through a cold catalyst, it'll clog up. So the result is, you know, the first half hour of a wood stove is the smokiest half hour of the entire burn because it's cold. Um, and so with a catalytic stove, that first half hour escapes and you're not doing any secondary combustion. Uh, so that's why the, um, this style is good when it can do both. Yeah, cars, I guess, well, the, the smoke we're putting through cars is much finer, so that catalyst heats up much faster and doesn't get clogged. With, with stoves, you know, you, it's a really a lot of smoke compared to liquid fuel appliances like, you know, your furnace or your car. Um, now, the other big trend is manufacturers are going to make single burn rate stoves. You know, right now, pretty much every stove has a lever. And when it's tested, it gets tested at the very least amount of air, the most amount of air, and two spots in between. Now, but every stove has a sweet spot. So if you can build a stove and only allow the air, enough air that goes through that hits that sweet spot, you can get down below two grams an hour. Now, this is good for air quality because the sweet spot is when the stove is most able to burn off its smoke. The problem is the stove will burn a lot faster. You can't get an overnight burn. Like consumers want to burn their stove all night, and so a lot of people, if, you, if this is your primary heating device, you live up north, you're probably not going to like a single burn rate stove. But a lot, a lot of the country, people won't mind it, and this will be a huge improvement to air quality. Um, yeah, and then there's, you know, ultimately there's a um, move to automate the wood stove with computers and sensors. And there's a company here in Maryland, MF Fire, and they're, they're doing just that. And uh, you, load, you can just load the wood and walk away. And a, the, a sensor, just like in her car, really, will make the stove operate in an optimal way. Um, and the big problem is they don't think there are enough consumers that want an automatic wood stove. So there's one company out making it already. What they do, they don't even tell the consumer that that's what's happening because they think consumers will be wary of it. And you do have to plug it in. It needs electricity. But the thing works great. And uh, there's a question whether you know there's enough of a market for it. OK, so I'm gonna, I have two slides here. I have the good things about the new EPA regulations, and I have the bad things. I'm going to start with the good things because generally, I think it's a good move. And, you know, a lot of people in the industry think that the first set of regulations in 1988, 1990 really saved the industry. A lot of companies went out of business, but we got cleaner stoves. And back then, you know, people, states were really clamping down. So, uh, okay, so a few things a new uh, law does. One thing, it requires companies to disclose efficiency accurately. Right now, if you look on pretty much any stove website, they'll exaggerate the hell out of their efficiency because there's no requirement to test it and report it in the same way. So since 2015, you do have to test and report your efficiency accurately, and that's, leading, that's a huge benefit for consumers. Uh, so yeah, before you'd, you'd see things like this, you know, 95% efficiency, which is just, I mean, some people were reporting 99% efficiency, and that was obviously bogus. And the other thing, these cheap stoves are off the market. These are made in China, 300 bucks. Um, uh, they, they really, you know, they're put in a lot of camps and garages, but they're off the market altogether. And, you know, these things are really undermining the market for American, better American-made stoves. Um, and then the last thing is the old outdoor wood boilers went off the market. So. Now the wood boilers have to be certified. Before wood boilers were, outdoor wood boilers were exempt. So the wood boilers you buy now, outdoor wood boilers, they're they're more expensive, probably two thousand dollars more expensive, but they're going to be a heck of a lot cleaner. Um, and oh, the other thing is you have to report B accurate BTU output. That's another area where stove manufacturers just exaggerated like crazy. 
So now consumers will really be able to know accurate B BTU output. Okay, dangers of new stoves. Good questions. Uh, if it's a total ban on all outdoor boilers, then no, unless they change the law. But if it all, if it, some counties may just say that you can't put in uncertified ones. So you'd really, it's probably county by county. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So one of the big dangers if sto is big question is will stove prices rise? Um, and it's really not clear that all brands will have ri rising prices. Some brands may, some brands might not, but if, a, if the price of a stove goes up even a couple hundred bucks, then people will stick with their old stove and they're not gonna buy a new one. That's not good for air quality. So that's one of the biggest potential downsides is you're not gonna have so many sales of new stoves. Um, another issue is you know there are always loopholes in these laws no matter how, how well EPA tries to write them and even the industry wants clear rules you know they don't want some companies finding a loophole and others not I mean so but loopholes will emerge <laughs> and it, we, we don't we're just kind of seeing um, for instance one loophole is with the outdoor wood boilers you can still sell an outdoor wood boiler for commercial use so you can still put it on your barn but you're not supposed to hook it up to your barn and your house or you're not supposed to tell the dealer say oh yeah I'm buying this for my barn and then you in fact, you're buying it for your house. I mean, you know, to some extent, you just can't control for everything. Uh, but, but there are little loopholes like that which are popping up. Stoves may become smaller, more finicky. Um, you know, because stoves are measured in grams per hour, not in grams per unit of heat. So a small stove can more easily pass the regulations than a big stove. Because they all, it's just a matter of how much smoke is coming out of the stack. It doesn't matter how much heat you're putting out. A lot of people think that leading more catalytic stoves is not good for consumers because a lot of consumers don't use a catalyst very well. Um, it may be more co consolidation in industry. And some of these, the consolidation is leading to more stoves being made by companies with shareholders and it's all about the profits so stoves where it used to be made by some guy who really cared about the quality is now going to be driven more by profits which is usually not a good thing for and these higher testing certification cost and the EPA can't even the EPA has five people working on wood stoves so you know, and for the industry, that's a bad thing because industry can't get answers and they can't get their stoves listed fast enough. Uh, they, they can't, uh, you know, EPA. So if, if there were more people at EPA, it would actually be better for this industry, I think. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, these are all. Uh... Okay, when uh, Harry in encouraged me to put in this slide. I started testing wood stoves down in Maryland in my shop. And these days, like with everything, you know, there's testing equipment is becoming cheaper. So for $1,000, we bought this little handheld thing. You hook it up to a computer so it downloads your data every five seconds. And you, you put it in the flue pipe and it'll tell you the efficiency of the stove. So I could go to any of your homes and in 15 minutes I could do a you know check on your stove exact same way that energy auditors look at your boiler you know an energy auditor one of the first things they'll do they go down and they stick these things in your your exhaust pipe and they can tell the efficiency of your your furnace or boiler and uh, a few things we learned it's really cool 13 percent oxygen whether you're a power plant or automobile or wood stove, you want 13% oxygen in your flue. And that means you've had good combustion. Um, and uh, for instance, this is a, we were testing, well, we tested all sorts of stoves, but most stoves, pellet, well, we were just doing pellet stoves. Most pellet stoves had oxygen like 18, 19%, and they had efficiencies in the 60s. So um, this was an Englander we tested. And 
and uh, well, had 16% oxygen the day we tested it. <clears throat> and we tested it every day for 30 days, so we really got a good sense of how this thing performed, not just in a lab setting, but kind of in a person's home, because we wouldn't clean the thing. We'd just run it straight out and test it as often as possible and get a good sense of how it did. And then the other thing you want, uh, CO, here's the CO, it's 462. Your CO, that's, that's pretty decent, uh, but it's better if it's like 200. And CO is often, it's kind of a surrogate for PM. It's carbon monoxide, and you have really complete combustion, that carbon monoxide should be burnt. Um, in fact, in Europe, when they, where they, they regulate stoves with CO, and they don't even test for particulate matter. Um, let's see. And yeah, these test stoves, they get this in Germany. If you live here in Maryland, where you have to bring your car in every two years to get an emissions test, in Germany, they do that with stoves. So they have every single chimney sweep. They all might not look like this. But uh, every single chimney sweep, they come in, ma they're mandated to come every two years, and they, they test, see how clean and efficient. Is the same for burning wood as pellets? Yeah, you still want 13%. Yeah. You want 13% or higher or lower? You want 13% oxygen, excess oxygen, so higher. So, it, well, well, actually, no. Well, uh, there's, uh, in the air right now, you have 20% oxygen. So you want it down to 13%. So it's lower than what's in, like, in this room. That 10, it'd be even better. Could be, but you then you start getting oxygen starved. So you need an, a certain amount of oxygen. Uh, I think you, I think you're right. I think 10 is, can be better. It's all, almost unrealistic, uh, especially in stoves. But once you get down to nine, then you're going to start smoking again because you don't have enough oxygen. Yeah. So in. in uh, I mean, we're in, in Germany, and, and Germans, you know, there's a rule, the Germans will follow it. So, uh, and uh, if you fail your test, they put a red sticker on your door. So you're ashamed, you know, it shames you in the neighborhood. <laughs> and you want to go out and get that thing as fixed as fast as possible. Okay, so now here's one thing we've really found is there's not much correlation between cleanliness and efficiency and price. Some of the cleanest, most efficient stoves are some of the cheapest stoves. And so this is another question about whether you know, these new regulations, which companies are going to fall hardest on. Um, some of the big name companies like Yodel have some of the highest emission stoves, and they're cast iron. And it's really hard and expensive to redesign cast iron compared to steel. So this is one of the most popular stoves in all of America. It costs 1200 bucks. It's the Englander 30NC, buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's. It's, it's 1.4 grams an hour, so way under the two grams that's allowed in 2020. So this stove will not have to be re redesigned. The price will not go up. Um, their benef they, have a, they also are able to build at scale. They can sell 10,000 of these, whereas a Yodel or a something might only sell 1,000 or 2,000, so they don't have the economy of scale. Um, this stove, I, we just bought it. Uh, so we, we, we do kind of what consumer reports do. We go out and buy it on the open market. We don't tell the uh, company, and we test it. <clears throat> this stove is 79% uh, efficient. It costs 1200 bucks. And uh, according to an EPA lab, it's the very, very cleanest pellet stove in the country, 0.28 grams an hour. So that's almost a tenth of what EPA allows almost a tenth of what EPA will allow in 2020. Now they allow 4.5. So it's under 0.3. And we, in, indeed, we, we got one of the very cleanest uh, burns ever, 167 PM of uh, carbon monoxide. Just one, are those, is, are, is it just the pellet stoves that can be so efficient right now? No, both are. This is a wood stove. Oh, I thought they were both pellets. No, this is wood. <laughs> That's pellet. See the. Um, they're, they're, so, they're already below the limit, but other people are jagging and tweaking over the lower limit. Yeah. It all depends. You know, a lot of companies that have their own internal R&D and their own internal labs, they're constantly tweaking. Some labs don't have internal R&D 
or some companies don't. So they have to, everything they do, they have to pay high price consultants to do for them. It all depends on your business model and whether you have you know, internal engineers who know how to innovate. Is it England or a US made still? Yeah, made in Virginia. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think the, some of the like the on their pellet stoves, the fan is probably made in Mexico. Some of the internal electronics, but all this, all the manufacturing is done. I think the wood stove is 100% uh, domestic. Every component. Does your organization have a listing of name brands and the performance? Yep. Yeah. Um, we only for pellet stoves. Uh, testing wood stoves is really difficult. Um, and so, for instance, we don't make such a big deal out of the efficiency of wood stoves because it all depends how the operator operates it. If you put green wood in it or if you ratchet down the air, your efficiency will go into the toilet. Um, but a pellet stove is automated. It, it'll burn pretty much in the lab as it does in your home. So it's really important if you're buying a pellet stove to check for efficiencies because they're some of the biggest manufacturers in the country you might know Enviro, that name. One of their most popular stoves is 58% efficient. And so, and, and they advertise 80% efficient. And so here, you know, a consumer unwittingly buys this and then you're, you know, stuck with an inefficient stove for many years. And if you're putting three or four tons of pellets in, you know, that's, hits your pocketbook. Uh, with wood stoves, you know, it's always up to the consumer. The best thing you can do for efficiency in a wood stove is buy season, uh, use seasoned wood and give the, give the stove enough air. Seasoned wood. Yeah. So 20% moisture content. You know, I don't know, this kiln dried wood at 10%, I'm not sure. I think that might be almost too dry. <laughs> uh, for Because wood stoves, you know, they're not really designed for that. Uh, even though, even though they're tested with two by fours, those two by fours are 20% moisture content. So that's what they're designed for. Because I wanted to talk a little bit about, in my view, you know, I'm all about wanting to keep wood stoves and pellet stoves um, in the mix with solar panels and geothermal. I don't, I think our community is in danger of being left behind. And the industry can keep selling a quarter million stoves a year, but you know, I would love to shoot much higher. And you see in places in Europe, like in Italy alone, there's more pellet stoves sold every year in Italy than there is in all North America. Uh, and it's partially because their you know, fossil fuel prices are higher, but it's partially because the government believes that this is a great solution for heating. Um, and so I would love you know, I really think in this country we should be selling half a million pellet stoves a year. We should be selling half a million wood stoves. I believe the the road to that is more regulation. It, well, I mean, the EPA has already been doing it, but that's my opinion. I know probably a lot of people don't agree with that. But, you know, we are being hit by public opinion a lot, and we're being hit by stricter air quality standards. So. In areas of the country, this is more out west than the east coast. The east coast, you know, we don't have inversions like they do out west. So out west is really ground zero for a lot of the stuff. Oregon and Washington and Seattle where there are these no-burn days because, you know, the air comes off the Pacific Ocean, hits the mountains, and traps all the pollutants along whatever mountain range there is there, So, which is all up and down the west coast. So we've really watched public opinion is really not leaning in our favor uh, in a lot of places. In a lot of places, it's kind of the same as it always was. But um, I know because I, uh, I get a lot of hate mail every day from air quality activists. And they you know, see me out there. And a lot of EPA does too. I mean, a lot of people think EPA is way too lenient on wood stoves. And a lot of these air quality activists think the EPA is in league with industry. <clears throat> And in league with groups like mine, and uh, you know they they want to some of these guys want to shut this industry down altogether. Um, so I think a few things. I think the wood wood pellets are, you know, they're co consistent clean. So I think that's been a good thing for our image. Um, and up north, 
up in New England, you know, there's really a lot of momentum behind giving incentives for the um, automated wood pellet boilers. Uh, a lot of these are made in Europe. So they give five thousand dollars to any house that wants to put in a wood pellet boiler. Good question. Because I have a wood pellet barbecue grill mm -hmm. made by Trevor. It's designed to be inefficient <laughs> because it wouldn't smoke otherwise. <laughs> Would it follow any of these same EPAs? No, they don't. Uh, no regulation for grills. Okay. Yeah. So it's made by the same company that makes yeah. wood pellet grills. No. No regulation at all for chimeneas or grills or or fireplaces. Um, a lot of the air quality folks wanted the EPA to regulate fireplaces, and it, it did not go there. Partially just for political reasons, it's like there'd be too big of a backlash. I just got a wood-fired pizza oven. I mean, a pellet-fired pizza oven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. I love it. So, um, yeah, so we, in the West Coast, especially, the, again, the anti wood burning folks are gaining some, some ground right now. You want to go through a few myths and facts. I probably could have put up many more, but one, you know, there are more restrictions, like, but there's not outright bans on wood burning, hardly anywhere. Uh, San Francisco just made a lot of headlines, and a lot of people think that wood burning is banned in San Francisco, but all they did is you say they can't put a wood burning stove or pellet burning stove in new construction, which is hardly any done anyhow. Um, Montreal is the tightest restrictions of any state of any city in North of America. And I think they're holding new stove to two grams an hour, so they've already adopted the 2020 regulations. Um, you know, there's only one place in America that I know of where you're not allowed to burn an uncertified stove. So they gave uh, incentives for two, three years to change out your uncertified one to get a certified one. And at this point, you just can't burn it at all. And, and they do have wood stove police. <laughs> they're, they're out in, in Portland and Seattle. They do have enforcement. And these people do, they drive, if, if a neighbor complains, they'll drive around and they point a, uh, a meter and check your opacity, and if, if you're putting out too much smoke for more than an hour at a time, you always get a warning first time, and then you can get a fine. Um, um, okay, the other thing, uh, I'm starting to see a lot of air quality activists are saying, wood smoke is worse than tobacco. Um, and that, you know, th there's no evidence on that. I mean, we know wood smoke is not good for you, there's no doubt. There's no form of smoke that's good for you, but there's also not really any evidence to say one form of smoke is necessarily any worse than any other type of smoke, unit for unit. Um, and one of the big issues today is how much smoke gets in your home and whether wood stoves create a lot of indoor air quality issues. Um, and the EPA says, has this figure, they say up to 70% more 70% of smoke will get in your home. And they, I said, come on guys, where's the, and they couldn't even find the study that uh, said that, but now that's getting reused by a lot of air quality activists. Um, and uh, what we found, we've, there's been a little, few, some studies, and it depends on your installation. If you have a good draw for your stove, you may have very, very minimal issues with your indoor air quality. Pellet stoves, you should hardly have any. If you smell smoke regularly in your house, then it is a concern. <laughs> yeah. And that sometimes is because you have poor insulation, and sometimes the wind, the prevailing wind. Sometimes your chimney isn't long enough, you're not getting a good enough draft. Sometimes some stoves, when you open them to reload, you get a good hefty puff of smoke. So, uh, but it's not necessarily, and usually the EPA certified stoves are better, but not always, like I say, it's the, the draft of the system, which is the most important. But it is something to consider, and we recommend, you know, if, if, you, if you do smell wood smoke in your home, getting a HEPA filter, an air, qual an air filter, not a bad idea. Or if you have a neighbor that's putting too much smoke in your house for whatever reason, it's usually outdoor wood boilers, um, HEPA air filters are a good investment. Okay, so I know these uh, bio bricks are probably not a 
There's probably not a lot of fans in this room for BioBricks, because uh, in some ways they could be a competitor firewood, but for wood smoke, they have proven to be a great um, way to reduce wood smoke, and they're really picking up steam in New England. Um, of course, they don't, these, the cardboard ones are not so crazy about. There's a lot of stuff in cardboard that you probably should not be burning. But uh, if it's pure wood, it's just like a big pellet. And uh, more and more people are marketing these um, as an alternative to firewood. So now I want to turn a little bit more to firewood. Um, and uh, you know, the, you guys are kind of at the front lines of helping homeowners understand the importance of seasoned wood. Hopefully, you're, you're, most of you are delivering seasoned wood, or if it's not seasoned. Um, I mean, the, the worst thing I, I hate to see is people advertising seasoned wood, selling it in November, and dropping a big pile of pretty unseasoned wood, because that wood is going to be burned that season. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, it's usually the smaller dealers who do that. The bigger guys can't afford to do that because they, um, you know, they got a business at stake. Um, but uh, I think more and more jurisdictions may start turning to wood because a clean burn needs three things. Uh, we say a good, needs a good stove, needs dry wood, and an operator that knows how to use their stove. So at each of those three things may be an equal component to a clean burn. Because you have a fantastic EPA certified stove, you fill it full of green wood and it's gonna smoke like some stove from the 1920s. Um, likewise, you could have dry wood, a good stove, but if you don't let the fire start uh, and it never gets up to temperature and the person jacks down the air, the thing can smoke even with very dry wood and you know a good secondary burn technology that should operate well. So you need all those three things. Um, and now you know there are some places out west where they're just getting cynical about wood stoves, and they just don't think they can they're reliable enough because too many people are burning wet wood, and too many people aren't operating them well. And I think part of it's because in the during the recession this past 15 years, there are a lot of new people doing it. I mean, old, a lot of the old timers, we think they know the importance of dry wood. They season their wood often, they get it themselves. They may season it even for two years, especially if it's oak. Um, but a lot of, you know, the suburbanites, uh, you know, they order their wood in November and they get it from someone that they, uh, you know, came knocking on their door and it's just, it's not seasoned. So we see some change-up programs now. Uh, there are a lot of jurisdictions that you know, will pay you 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks if you take your old wood stove out and put in a new EPA certified one. But now there's some s programs that say, sorry, we're not gonna uh, give a subsidy for wood stoves. If we want you to take out the old one, but we're only gonna give you a subsidy to put in gas or pellets. Um, and to me, in a way, that's kind of a pity. But it's not necessarily, it's kind of a rational choice if you live in an area that's in non-attainment or this, yeah. Is this about Maryland program? Oh yeah, well, I did in the very beginning. And you're, uh, yeah, so Maryland has a program. We, we give uh, 700 rebate for pellet stoves and 500 for wood. And it's amazing in Maryland, 80% of the people choose, get the rebate for pellets. Uh, I think that's partially because people, because there's a requirement, you have to have it professionally installed. And a lot of people want to install it themselves, so they said, ah, forget the $500 rebate. I'll just buy the stove and install it myself. But there's no change out requirement, so you don't have to turn in an old stove to get the rebate. I think we're pretty much the only state in the country, and that's partially because Jonathan and I were some of the architects behind that. And we wanted more people to have access to good wood stoves, good pellet stoves. Once you require people to pull out an old, old stove, the program gets really more complicated and more expensive, and you don't have so many people taking advantage of it. Um, yeah, so this is just what we were talking about. The, uh, 
And now the, the, this bottom point, there's no label or certification for seasoned wood, like many countries have. You know, for those of you who heard Joel Friedman, he has a certification program. That's for packaged wood. There's, there's nothing really for cordwood. Um, but other, you know, other countries, this, the industry is much more uh, developed in that way. Sometimes it's out of necessity because the government has said, listen, if you guys don't do it, we might. It's kind of like with uh, pellets in this country. There is a whole certification program for pellets in the United States. And it's partially because the EPA said, listen, industry, you know, will you guys set up a program? And if you don't, we may have to do it because there's so many problems with pellet quality. So what you have, like in France, uh, this is a very recognizable symbol, and it comes on cordwood, and it guarantees that the consumer buys what they pay for. It doesn't matter if it's seasoned or unseasoned, but if you advertise it as seasoned, it has to be seasoned. And if you get complaints and they find that you're selling unseasoned wood after you claim it's seasoned, they kick you out of the program. But uh, consumers really look for the label. It's just like you know other successful labels, uh, like the Energy Star label. A lot of you know once it gets well known enough, there's a demand for it. Then uh, a lot of producers want it on their label. And if, and if you're selling seasoned wood anyway, then it's why not? Um, so you know AFPDA. If um, Joel is here, who runs that? So that's a pretty good system. I mean, they're, part, they're almost all the way there of getting third-party certification. For, you know. And this is, again, this is kind of because USDA uh, is breathing down their back. This, this, this has much more to do with pests, um, uh, so you don't transport pests between states. What, uh, but this is just all really more about moisture contents, more about pollution and um, now, the NFA, unfortunately, Scott Salvinson is not here, but these guys did set up the National Firewood Association to focus on the cordwood industry. But it's not really a genuine industry association. I think it's actually a for-profit. I mean, they're doing good work, but they haven't really been able to get the industry uh, to you know, gather around them and really make something of it. So maybe they still will. I hope so. But I, think, I still think there's a big need in uh, the firewood industry to get some sort of symbol that will distinguish you from your competitors and that will be recognizable to the consumer and show that you are delivering seasoned wood. Yeah, okay, I just talked about NFA. Based up in um, Duluth, Minnesota, Scott has spoken at these things in the past. He's a great guy. They 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 have almost no money, so they uh, it's one of the reasons he couldn't come. He didn't have. I mean, the organization just isn't uh, uh, doing that well right now financially. Okay, so here's a example. There are a couple jurisdictions that are now really looking to firewood, um, and this one is in Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska. Ha probably has the worst uh, oh, problem of anywhere in the country because their heating season was about 11 months long and uh, tons of outdoor wood boilers. And so they had a voluntary program where they said uh, to firewood dealers, if you um, join our program and carry this label, we will advertise for you and we will uh, you know, urge consumers to buy your wood. And what that means, when they deliver wood, um, they have to, at the point of sale, they have to test it with a moisture meter uh, three different logs. So they first split the log, test it for moisture, and then they write down the moisture content for the consumer. So you prove to the consumer right at the point of sale that they're getting whatever they get, they get. But if you say it's seasoned, it better be seasoned. Um, and now I think it, it really worked well, and the firewood dealers liked it. it uh, I think the established ones thought it was good because it, you know, the guys on Craigslist were kind of getting squeezed out. Um, and now they're going to make it mandatory. So to, to deliver wood in Fairbanks, Alaska, you have to bring a moisture meter and show that it's seasoned. What percentage equates seasoned? 20%. 20%. Yeah. I don't know exactly how they, you know, what happened. You know, if one piece happens to be 25, I don't know exactly how they deal with that.
I think it's, you know, I think industry has really got behind it, so they've taken their cues from the firewood dealers around there just to make sure it's fair. Um, so this is the sort of thing that could pop up in other places. Um, yeah. Good. This one is 50 to 100. Some, so you can get them for 10 bucks. Uh, some of those actually are not bad. Wood stove companies now or include a free moisture meter in with your stove as a way to educate homeowners. And, um, and I always tell people, man, if you if you buy wood before that wood is dumped in your driveway, have a moisture meter because once that wood is dumped in your driveway, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the momentum is against you. If you're not getting what you expected, you'd get. Um, <clears throat> Okay, San Francisco is another place. Of course, San Francisco. Yeah. Before you move on, in your travels, um, what type of, do you get any uh, input or feedback from firewood producers in terms of promoting a national standard, season firewood standard? Well, I'd, I'd love to hear what people here think. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's good. My, my, this is my opinion as a business owner. Not that the regulation is bad, but it's not good. It actually is a good thing. Um, one thing I promote, I talk to people is on my business, I have a DNR um, on Forest Fire Operators license, which is required in Maryland to sell firewood. At first, I think I'll just the government regulate me again, but I actually am on their list now for a licensed firewood seller. I get one third of my calls from them. Wow. It's hmm. working. It's working for you then, right? It's definitely working. Yeah. And I don't know about the DNR throughout the state because it works different offices, but they actually allowed me not only list the county I work out of, but two other counties. So I'm on actually on three different lists for those. Wow. So how about if Maryland says you can't be on that list unless you agree to a program like this? Yeah. Well, I would love maybe Jonathan. Jonathan, we could keep this discussion going even after. Maybe have a meeting after this conference and sit down with DNR and talk about that. Maybe Maryland could be kind of a, uh, a test ground. I mean, we, Maryland typically we don't have huge wood smoke issues uh, like you know, some New England or especially out west. But someone has to start. <laughs> okay, uh, so San Francisco they do regulate it. You you have to pretty heavy regulation in the Bay Area. They do everything first, um, and luckily, a lot of stuff doesn't move west, but some of it will. Australia, very successful model. They, um, the industry uh, really regulates. It's self-regulation. It's not government. The government, in fact, gave them money to start their program, so they, it's a voluntary program, but pretty much everyone has to be part of it. Okay, in Europe, uh, France, there are a lot of places where this, this stuff is happening more and a lot of wood is being <coughs> delivered like this a lot more. And I would love to see firewood and energy audits. So I'm pushing a lot of states, when the energy auditor comes to your house, if you use wood as your primary heat source, the energy auditor should look at your stove, not just you know the furnace in your basement. And they should go out to your wood pile, check your wood, and and just to educate the homeowner and tell the homeowner, oh, it looks like your wood is 30%. Uh, you should have it to 20. Just to you know, reinforce that message, put something in writing, urge the person to upgrade from an ancient stove if, uh, if it is ancient. Because um, right now, you know, I had an energy audit. I said, I told the guy, you know, I, I heat my house with wood. I, said, I don't care. I don't have, there's no place on the form for that. <laughs> But in rural areas, that's ridiculous. You know, they should be, they should help the homeowner understand uh, how to fix and upgrade their stuff. Okay, that's it. Do we have time for a question, Jonathan? Thank you.
I suspect half those stoves can be redesigned pretty easily to get under two grams an hour. So far, there's no company that looks like it's going to go out of business because of the regulations. But yeah, there is a question of it's going to drive up prices. And I think for some manufacturers, it will drive up prices. But I think there'll still be a healthy array of stoves on the market. And hopefully, I know a lot of these companies are eager to get their R&D people on it. and. Um, and they think they can meet the regulations.